Guten Tag, willkommen in der Restmed Lounge. Wir wollten Sie einladen, mit Professor Sullivan eine kleine Frage- und Antwortrunde zu betreiben. Er ist hier, wir haben das Glück, dass er dieses Jahr beim, beim DGSM und beim, äh, beim Zahnärztlichen Schlafmedizinkongress ist. Und da wir aus der Erfahrung wissen, dass es viele Fragen gibt, auch heute Morgen schon bei seinem Vortrag viele Fragen aufkamen und auch heute Abend ist sicherlich bei uns im Symposium einige Fragen gibt, aber die Zeit dann Richtung Gesellschaftsabend kurz wird, haben wir gedacht, wir laden ihn hier in die Lounge ein, sind froh, dass er da ist und ähm, wollten jetzt einfach über ähm, ein paar häufig gestellte Fragen an ihn letztendlich mit ihm eine kleine Diskussionsrunde machen, weil es schon spannend ist, wie man auch heute schon heute Morgen in seinem Vortrag gesehen hat, wie, wie, wie beschwerlich der Weg war auf dem Weg zu den, zu den heute verfügbaren Produkten, die wir gerade hier auf, dem, auf diesem Kongress finden. Und was man nicht vergessen darf, dass, dass das Wachstum der Schlafmedizin ist vor allem die respiratorische Schlafmedizin gewesen. Weil wenn wir uns die Fallzahlen in deutschen Schlaflaboren anschauen, ist über 90 Prozent respiratorische Schlafmedizin. Das heißt, das Wachstum auch gerade dieser Gesellschaft und des, des Feldes ist sehr stark abhängig gewesen von der Entwicklung des CPAPs. Und ähm, zum anderen muss man auch sagen, ähm, er nannte das heute schon mehrfach der Invisible Disease, dass obstruktive Schlafapnoe sozusagen nicht, nicht erkennbar war. Was auch daran lag ist, ähm, wenn man sich in der Medizin anschaut, man hat selten nach Dingen gesucht, die man nicht behandeln konnte. Ja, so dass wir einfach die Zeit jetzt mit ihm die nächste halbe Stunde nutzen wollen und ähm, einfach, ähm, er wird Fragen beantworten und ist sein Deutsch, wie wir heute schon festgestellt haben, er, er braucht hm. noch zwei Wochen, hat er gesagt, in zwei Wochen, in two weeks, ähm, äh, 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 ist, 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 ist er wieder ähm, flüssig mit äh, fließend im, 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 im Deutsch sprechen, ähm, weil er hat in der Schule fünf Jahre Deutsch, it may be three, but um, maybe four. Um, <lacht> aber, well, with a good sleep it might be two. So, um, aber wir werden es zweisprachig halten sozusagen, er, er wird die Antworten Englisch geben, wir werden einfach Zusammenfassungen in Deutsch geben, wir können auch die Fragen hin und her übersetzen, also Sie brauchen jetzt hier nicht auf Englisch sozusagen mit ihm sprechen, ja, so dass einfach, ähm, ich glaube, die, die, die interessanteste Frage, mit der wir mal starten können sozusagen, ähm, und dann freuen wir uns, wenn, wenn, wenn Sie mit Fragen hinzukommen, ist, I think the most, the burning question in the room is always, you know, how did you get the idea okay. to create the CPAP device? Well, my usual answer is that I don't know, <laughs> uh, uh, but it's, uh, and the way I answer it is to give you the context of what I was doing. And at the time, uh, my, I had trained in Sydney as a physician, and then I did a doctorate in physiology, and I'd, uh, at that time, physiology was measuring variables, blood pressure, airflow. Uh, and then I spent uh, some time in Canada where I worked with Dr. Philipson, who had, had developed a model of measuring breathing in sleeping dogs. Um, then I returned to Sydney and my main role was to look after sick patients with respiratory failure. But then I also started to look for patients with sleep apnea. They weren't there. We had to look for them. And I also set up both animal models and human models of upper airway obstruction. Also, letztendlich ähm, sagt er, seine häufigste Antwort auf die Frage ist, er weiß es selber nicht so genau. Weil wenn man sich den, den Werdegang anschaut, war es sozusagen damals in, in, in Sydney eigentlich gewesen, ging dann nach Kanada zu Elliot Phillips, ein sehr bekannter ähm, Atmungsphysiologe, die aber damals Hunde dazu verwendet haben, sozusagen Atmungsphysiologie zu betreiben. Die haben Hunde damals tracheotomiert. Davon verdanken wir heute auch sozusagen viele äh, physiologische Erkenntnisse der Schlafapnoe äh, äh, haben wir vom Hundemodell, vom tracheotomierten Hundemodell. Und als er zurückkam nach Sydney letztendlich, hat er versucht, weil in seiner Zeit in Kanada hat er gearbeitet als Wissenschaftler, während er also nach Sydney zurückkam, musste er wieder klinische Aufgaben übernehmen. Und da haben sie sozusagen dann versucht, sich mit der Thematik weiter zu beschäftigen. Und das, das Grundziel war erstmal, das Grundziel hatte überhaupt nichts mit einer Schlafapnoe-Therapie zu tun. Das Grundziel, als er zurückkam aus Kanada nach Sydney, war die Tatsache, ein physiologisches ähm, Konstrukt zu entwickeln, wie man Atmung messen kann. Atmung am Tag und Atmung im Schlaf. Weil es gab damals diese Messmethodik gar nicht, sodass das Ganze mit einer physiologischen Untersuchung sozusagen losging. The, the practical problem 
that had to be solved to look at how breathing is altered by sleep was how to measure airflow. <coughs> uh, the model that Dr. Philipson had set up was to do a tracheostomy, tracheotomy uh, <coughs> of exactly the same type that we were then using for sleep apnea. So it was the skin heel to the mucosa. Yeah. So it was clean. Uh, when the dog ran around, it could breathe normally. But when we wanted to do the test, we simply put the tube in through the trachea. <coughs> and with that, we were doing the effect of hypoxia, hypercapnia, and airway occlusion, so simulating obstructive apnea. <coughs> uh, however, that's not possible to do in human volunteers. So part of the task was how to measure breathing, capture airflow, and yet allow the person to sleep. Though, in fact, what I did when I got back to Sydney was to look at how the response to obstructed breathing in the dog was different if it was at the trachea versus the nose. So, in fact, I had to make nose masks, snout masks for the dog. Um, simultaneously, I was making masks for ourselves so we could measure breathing and occlude the airway. So that's the background to thinking about the CPAP. Also, <coughs> die Fragestellung damals war sozusagen, wie man Atemfluss messen kann. Haben wir heute auch noch im Schlaflabor, aber damals war es deutlich schwierig. Es gab kein Equipment. Deshalb ging man damals dazu über, Atemfluss zu messen, zum einen über das Tracheostoma, wenn es der Hund hatte sozusagen. Und beim Hund ist man dann drüber, da ist ja dazu übergegangen, die Fragestellung war sozusagen, was ist der Unterschied, wenn man durch ein Tracheostoma atmet, wie gegenüber, wenn man durch, eine Na durch die Nase atmet. Deshalb haben die damals überhaupt Nasenmasken entwickelt. Und diese Technologie, also der Nasenmaskenentwicklung, die sie damals getrieben haben, war nicht primär, um nachher irgendwie CPAP zu machen, sondern erstmal um Atemfluss zu messen. Und diese Entwicklung, die sie gemacht haben beim Hund, da gibt es fantastische Bilder, ich denke, wird nachher im Symposium noch ein oder zwei zeigen dazu. Diese Entwicklung vom Hund wurde dann sozusagen dazu verwendet, mhm. bei Menschen das, ähm, das auch sozusagen Atemfluss zu messen und dann über die Messung des Atemflusses auch diesen Atemfluss zu beeinflussen über die Maske. In, in fact, I, I thought about the idea of uh, making positive pressure uh, quite a long time before I did the test. And the reason for that long time was that we didn't have patients. <clears throat> so I had to find a patient who it was possible to do the experiment on. And secondly, I had to work out how to uh, create a mask which sealed. Uh, uh, so when I, the patient that I first did the test on was a very sick sleep apnea patient who in fact had refused tracheotomy. And we, I said, well, would you agree to do this experiment? I may not work. Uh, and it, of course, did work. <coughs> and uh, that's where, uh, once it worked, it was actually had a, uh, a very, it was incredibly exciting because uh, initially I thought we would do this experiment. Uh, we started at about nine o'clock at night that we would try it out, finish at 11 and go home. But because it worked, we stayed there all night and of course he slept all night. And after we'd turned the pressure up and stopped it, dropped the pressure again, it came back, turned it up again, went away. Uh, you, we did not need statistics. It was a physical experiment and it worked. So then on the spot at the time, I thought, well, let's stay here all night and see if it worked. I think it's not to be used. 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 It's not to Und darüber kam die Idee, sozusagen CPAP auszuprobieren. Ja, weil bei diesem Patienten eben, die Patienten, die, die sie damals identifizieren, waren schwerste Schlafapnoiker. Da gab es keine AHI-Bestimmung oder so. Das waren schwerste Schlafapnoiker, sozusagen die man, äh, Blickdiagnose. Und nachdem dieser Patient die, die Tracheotomie ablehnt hatte, kamen sie auf die Idee, das, das, das zu, zu versuchen. But um, now having a positive experiment yeah. and, and, and getting excited about, you know, having a new idea, um, the problem was there was a one-night therapy. 
Yes, so, that's, so, right. Um, that's right. I, I guess you created <clears throat> your own problem. That's correct. And it's interesting because now it all seems very obvious, but it was not obvious at the time. And initially, uh, I know when I presented that the, the reaction of most people was, why doesn't the air come out the mouth? And that's right. We thought we're going to pressurise only through the nasal airway. Why doesn't it come out the mouth? I remember the moment it worked, uh, uh, I sort of realised that that's telling us something about the anatomy, about the structure. That the soft palate and tongue must be working together. <clears throat> and then, of course, realised that that's part of the problem. If if the person who is snoring and obstructing could breathe through the mouth, they wouldn't have sleep apnea. So they, it really taught something very much about the anatomy straight away. Um, I think uh, we initially, I saw it, it was, a, it was an experiment, uh, not a treatment. Uh, and of course, uh, it led to us thinking, ah, there's a whole lot of experiments to do, which we did. We did a whole series of experiments. and. My first five patients were all patients who were booked in for a tracheotomy. <clears throat> they were really sick patients and they would come into hospital, we would do the tests and then they were meant to have a tracheostomy, which four of the five did. Uh, but one of my patients, after he tried this, said, oh, I will try it, let me try it at home. <clears throat> and that's how we got started with the home therapy. Also am Anfang war, war große Skepsis gegenüber der Therapie, weil die, die, man hatte ja damals, deshalb gab es ja die vielen Versuche, kein so großes Verständnis sowohl für die Anatomie als auch für die Physiologie des oberen Atemweges. Und die Hauptfrage nach der ersten erfolgreichen Nacht war, warum geht die Luft eigentlich zum Mund raus? Ja. Und äh, warum, ist, warum, warum funktioniert das überhaupt? Ja. Und ähm, daraufhin haben sie mehr Versuche gemacht, eigentlich immer mit den Patienten, die zur Tracheotomie angemeldet waren. Damals war die Standardtherapie der schweren Schlafapnoe der Luftröhrenschnitt. Ja? Und ähm, dann haben sozusagen die Patienten, die zum Luftröhrenschnitt angemeldet waren, eine Nacht vorher ähm, mit diesen, ja, mit letztendlich, was heute CPAP ist, ähm, versucht zu behandeln, was gut funktioniert hat. Und einer dieser fünf Patienten sagte dann, ähm, kann ich das nicht auch zu Hause probieren? Warum soll ich mir ein Loch in den Hals machen lassen, wenn ich nicht auch, wenn ich damit vielleicht äh, drumherum komme? Und damit ging sozusagen die Geschichte los. Jetzt sind wir erfolgreich im Labor, aber ähm, was machen wir jetzt sozusagen? Ist ja ähnlich wie Zähneputzen. Das bringt nur was, wenn man es jeden Abend macht. Von daher, um, I compared it with brushing your teeth. It just works, you know, when you do it every day. So the next challenge was, you know, the patient is asking for a device for home yes. use. Um, so how well, do you manage it? Well, what we uh, The problem then was that there were really no suitable masks, although there were many masks for anaesthetic, uh, for protecting you from dust. Uh, none of the masks would provide a pressure seal or be sufficiently comfortable to use for six, eight hours a night. So we very quickly started to manufacture masks which we cast. We make a cast of the nose and make a very Uh, close-fitting mask uh, which initially was uh, sealed with rapid se rapidly setting silastic, uh, a medical grade silastic. Uh, we also put a circuit together initially the first, very first take-home uh, CPAP machine uh, was the uh, a two-stage vacuum cleaner fan Uh, not as people think my mother's vacuum cleaner, it was a two-stage <laughs> vacuum fan which we set up in a box and had a belt drive from an AC motor. Okay. And we had an inlet tube and an outlet tube uh, separate from the motor so that if the motor burnt out there would be no uh, toxic gases. So that was the first machine. Uh, the first <coughs> problem was, also, first of all, there were no masks. Es gab Masken in der Anästhesie, es gab Masken gegen Staub, aber es gab ja keine Masken für die Heimtherapie. Das heißt, zu dem Zeitpunkt musste ja jede Maske für jeden Patient individuell gemacht werden, ja, sodass das das erste Problem war. Und sie haben dann viele verschiedene Materialien getestet und haben dann ein elastisches Material, was damals auch in der, in der Prothetik sozusagen verwendet wurde, genommen und haben dann bei jedem Patient sozusagen, was wir heute eine individuelle Nasenmaske nennen würde, gemacht. Und ähm, dann war die nächste Problematik sozusagen die Technik. 
Sie hatten eigentlich ein Gebläse verwendet, was sozusagen damals, was ich vorgelernt hatte, ähm, verwendet hatten, entweder äh, in der Zahnheilkunde, um sozusagen den Bohrer anzutreiben, oder was Jacuzzi sozusagen die Blubberblasen drin gemacht hat. Ja, was ich jetzt gerade gehört hatte, ist, das erste Gerät, das nach Hause ging, hat sozusagen das Gebläse gehabt, was aus einem Staubsauger kam. Ja? Ähm, und damit haben sie sozusagen ein, ein, dann auch die Idee damals schon, zwei getrennte Luftkreisläufe, also einen, wo der Patient die Luft kriegt sozusagen, der andere, der den Motor belüftet, weil wenn das Ding in Flammen aufgeht, hätte der Patient eine Rauchgasvergiftung gekriegt. Und von daher war damals alles noch sehr, es war heikel, das sozusagen mit äh, nach Hause zu geben. By the so, way, were you aware of that in 1936, There was a group of American um, uh, specialists in, in heart failure yes. who used <coughs> the blower of a vacuum cleaner. Yeah. Barack, 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 Barack. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, well, no, at the time I was not aware of that okay. work. Um, uh, but in looking back at it, mm -hmm. they were actually treating, they didn't realize that they would have treated upper airway obstruction, but their thinking was that it was lung. Uh, but. I was going to say that our first, although that was the first machine, I think you mentioned that we very quickly found a relatively inexpensive flow generator, the Hitachi Vortex Blow, did you mention it, I think, already, um, which was really only several hundred dollars for us to purchase. And it produces a very high flow, very large pressure. And because it was so inexpensive for us, uh, we, we started to use them immediately. But the circuit we had to make uh, had very large pipe coming from this mach machine and a T-piece leaking most of the air to atmosphere. Uh, and that gave us a, if you like, a pressurised circuit, a pressurised atmosphere from which the subject was breathing, but with a very low impedance meaning if they didn't take, although the pressure might be 10, they didn't need to generate much pressure differential to get an inspiration, and they didn't need to increase the pressure too much to get expiration. But how we set the pressure, once we worked out what they needed, what was, we would actually set a fixed valve which would leak pressure to atmosphere and give a pressure at the mask of 9, 12, 7, etc. Also das Entscheidende ist, ähm, das war sozusagen ein Standardgebläse, wie gesagt, zum Beispiel was Jacuzzis angetrieben hat von Hitachi, darf man ein bisschen Werbung für Hitachi machen, waren ja damals, also war kein Medical Equipment sozusagen. Und die, die, die Problematik war jetzt, da gab es ja auch nicht nur den Druck einstellen, ja? also keine Drehschraube, sonst was. Also wie sie es gemacht haben, sie haben einfach eine gewollte Leckage eingebaut und je niedriger der Druck sein sollte, umso mehr Leckage haben sie eingebaut was eine immense Leckage war, weil das Gerät war ein Hochflussgenerator. Ja, da, dadurch war es natürlich auch für die Patienten verhältnismäßig angenehm, drauf zu atmen, weil sie einen guten Fluss erhalten haben. Ja, also sie haben nie das Gefühl gehabt, am Gerät ziehen zu müssen. Aber die Problematik war, ähm, es gab eine immense Leckage und ähm, dadurch auch ähm, sehr, sehr viel Strömung geräuscht. Wasn't that first device too noisy for a home use? I mean, we, we have people complaining yeah. about modern devices and saying, well, I can't use that. So. So oh, well, modern people. But <laughs> right. Well, no, it was very noisy, but in fact it was such a big source, we'd, it would typically be put in outside the bedroom, and we would use quite a long pipe to come into the bedroom. Um, I think one thing that's very important to recall is that at that point we were seeing the really extreme degree of sleep apnea. So most of the people we saw really severe sleep apnea. So uh, to go from uh, 90 decibel snoring to a, a mere uh, blower in the corner was not a big problem. Uh, <laughs> and, and in addition, they, they got so much benefit from it. That's what drove the area, that they'd be awake. Uh, um, I think one of the, although today with these uh, beautiful machines, and masks, it's hard to look back at what it was like. Uh, but it actually took a long time for people to take the therapy seriously, uh, particularly among medical colleagues who had, couldn't, uh, their acceptance of this invisible disease took a long time, still does. I mean, there's still some people who think, oh, can't be very serious. And then Moreover, not only is this strange invisible disease, but you're using a, uh, 
a pump and a mask. Uh, so that was a lot of resistance to it being accepted, particularly among medical people. I, in, indeed, the, a lot of the drive for us doing it came from the patients, because we'd have patients who, uh, as you know, these people, in, often in a terrible state, go on treatment and wake up and feel oh, I have not been awake for five years. So this is, so that's one. That was the big driver uh, in the early days of this therapy. Also, the große Unterschied eben damals war, dass man nur wirklich die schwersten Patienten gesehen hat, weil man wirklich sich ja nur auf das klinische Bild konzentriert hat. Es war ja damals nicht so, dass man eine, so wie heute eine Polygraphie kriegt, um nach Schlafapnoe zu schauen. Man hat wirklich nach den Patienten mit den schweren Symptomen geschaut. Und dadurch, dass sie so schwere Symptome hatten und dadurch auch dann laute Schnarche waren, war das, Gerät, das, das Gerätegeräusch immer noch besser als sozusagen diese, diese Alternative. Und damit war damals auch die, die Therapieadrenz, obwohl es sicherlich ähm, erstmal nicht wie typisches medizinisches Equipment aussah, sehr hoch. Aber ähm, das, was uns heute noch so geht, war damals umso mehr. Also die, zum einen war die Erkrankung überhaupt nicht bekannt, dann noch eine Therapie, die sozusagen so selber zusammengestellt war mit einer Maske und einem Schlauch und so. Also die Ablehnung damals von den Kollegen außerhalb dieser, dieser kleinen Gruppe an Spezialisten war, war extrem hoch. When was the first time you really felt that CPAP would become part of medical practice? When, when did it change? Well, the, the, when, when weren't you too exotic on conferences? Yeah. Well, uh, I put it into context that my, my clinical work was looking after sick patients with respiratory failure. So I'd, uh, had, put, I'd had quite a number of patients we'd done tracheostomy on uh, and with great benefit. Um, and initially, uh, I did see the therapy as a rescue therapy, which would give us time, uh, help the patient recover, and prepare them for surgery, whether it be uh, UPP or whatever, because that surgery was starting at that time. Um, so in addition, uh, because I'm very much a clinical scientist, uh, the, the experiment that this provided was so exciting, uh, that was a big driver for us. We, we were seeing the opportunity to do measurements, uh, the, the, as you know, these people have unbelievably uh, severe hypoxia, repeated hundreds of times, and that was simply not possible to get. You couldn't contemplate doing an experiment like that in a normal subject, or even in an animal subject. So our dog experiments, we couldn't get permission to do hypoxia that these patients do. So we we had this incredible <coughs> experimental model. And you know, what we started doing was taking the patients, we're measuring growth hormone, measuring ventilatory responses, measuring blood pressure before and after treatment. So when I think back, because of my interest in the science, that was a big driver for us. I mean, of course, it was wonderful to have the patients treated. It probably didn't <coughs> really emerge that I would see this as a long-term treatment really until the early 1980s, when 81, 82. And really what happened is that it became clear that the surgery that was being done was not working. Uh, and so it did have some benefit. Uh, and yet, in contrast, this therapy completely switches off sleep apnea and had such great uh, clinical responses. But it took a long time to, uh, every time I'd have a patient who'd come back, he'd been on this for three months, and, I, and they'd say, well, when are you going to cure it, doc? <laughs> when, when's the treatment? And I'd say, well, we're working on it, maybe next year, maybe <laughs> the year after. <laughs> so uh, in, a, in a sense, by about 1985, we had about 100 people on this treatment, and, and the benefits were so obvious that it became clear that it certainly would be something that would be used for at least some years. I, it might be too much before, but let me, one, one, thing, one thing I did think, I thought, aha, if we can treat this and they wake up and exercise, they'll lose weight. So initially I thought, ah, if we can treat the metabolic problem, they'll lose weight. Uh, we were 
We had our first 100 patients that we followed up for some five years and the mean change in weight was zero. So <laughs> some of them increased, some of them decreased. So it really, so uh, initially I was telling people, well this is going to help you. You go on to treatment, exercise, reduce weight, you won't need the treatment. But that did not work out. <laughs> Also ich glaube, allein an der Sprache kann man viel erkennen, aber vielleicht drei, vier Dinge, um sie nochmal herauszustellen. Was die Gruppe damals getrieben hat, ähm, der Antrieb sozusagen, die, die, die Motivation, war viel die Wissenschaft. Weil es war eine Gruppe von, von Atmungsphysiologen sozusagen. Und das Spannende ist ja, das, das hört man immer wieder raus, sie wollten ja diese Hundeexperimente machen. Aber zum Beispiel das, was der schlafapnoe patient zeigt im Experiment, wäre bei einem Hund nie zugelassen gewesen. Ja, also sozusagen, man hätte am Tier nicht machen dürfen, was am Mensch stattgefunden hat, sozusagen. Von daher war das natürlich ein optimales Modell, um, Atmung, um Atmungsphysiologie auch zu lernen, um Reaktion auf, ähm, ja. auf ähm, intermittierende Hypoxie zu lernen und auch, was macht das, sowohl der Stoffwechsel als auch, was macht äh, der, der, der Kreislauf damit. So dass das sozusagen eigentlich der Haupttreiber war in diesem Modell. Am Anfang war ihnen wirklich nicht bewusst, dass es eine Langzeittherapie war, weil zum einen haben sie gesagt, jetzt machen sie es mal drei Monate, und nach drei Monaten kamen die Patienten und sagen sie, ja, wir suchen immer noch nach was anderem, machen sie es halt noch mal ein Jahr. Ja, also es war am Anfang keinem bewusst, dass das eine Langzeittherapie sozusagen werden würde. Und zum anderen war damals eins genauso wie heute, ähm, wir dachten immer, wenn wir die Patienten behandeln, dann nehmen sie ab, weil dann sind sie ja fitter und dann brauchen sie keinen Mars macht mobil mehr, sondern dann sind sie von selber mobil und dann nehmen sie ab. Aber schon damals war der Gewichtsverlust im Mittel bei den ersten 100 Patienten null. Ja, einige haben abgenommen, einige nehmen zu, weil sie abends vom Fernseher wieder was essen können. Von daher war sozusagen der, der, der I just told my theory why sleep apneics gain weight, because you know they can watch television at night and eat some peanuts. So that's, so that's the reason, because they, they are staying awake. So that's, that's the reason, of course, in all major trials lately, 600 grams over one year yeah, of weight that's gain. So that's right. Aber das war sozusagen damals, damals, damals die, 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 die Problematik. When, I mean, so we're, we're in 1985, and, and there you have now 100 mm. patients treated, yes, and, and I guess there, there is more demand coming up. Right. So, so, so how did you manage? I mean, you, you got an in increasing clinic with sleep aid. Yes, and, oh yes. No, well. Just one point for, for, for the audience. What has to be sure, made sure for us is you build each of those 100 devices yes. in 100 masks. Yeah, that's and, right. And that's you, right. how long were they lasting, yeah. especially the masks? The masks last for a long time because the the, the mask was made like a shell okay. uh, uh, initially out of fiberglass mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, how it was put on was with a small amount of uh, this rapidly setting silastic which they'd put in and it, it was I, I, it sort of glued on uh, but then in the morning they could peel it off and it would fit very nicely again for several nights and then they'd have to replace that. Um, I think, yes, we made them. Uh, I did, at the same time, uh, I had, um, I forget how much work there was, but we were, had to establish a clinic. So I, I had to get space in the hospital to establish a clinic. I had to fight to get space for sleep lab, uh, etc. Uh, but uh, my facility at the university I always had a workshop, electronics, uh, mechanical, and I had a technical officer. In fact, um, my technical officer who joined me was uh, is Swiss German, Jim Bruder, his name. His family came from Basel, and he was he actually joined me and was making these. We got so busy. I also employed one of my patients, who was on non-invasive ventilation, to actually put the devices together. Can I, can I just add one thing that I just recall is that when we first started using the therapy, I did think that there might be recovery and that after treatment was used for a week, a month, two months, that they may improve. And we did a whole series of studies where we did the diagnostic study, treatment for five days or six days and then repeated the study and then similarly treatment for a month and repeated the study and in all of those patients they undoubtedly improved the severity of apnea always got better and it, initially we were thinking ah oh, maybe we could have pulse therapy mm -hmm. five nights on 
holiday for the weekend, etc. And we tried that, but found that we were far better to get people to take it as regularly as they could. Also, ein Punkt, den er gerade noch unbedingt anbringen wollte, ist, dass sie am Anfang ja wirklich auch dachten, ja, wenn ich den Atemweg unter Druck setze und ich, ich durchbreche diesen, diesen ständigen Kollaps im Schlaf, dass dann die Sache sich verbessern konnte. Und sie hatten dann das <lacht> versucht, sowohl mal für, für einige Tage zu behandeln, dann einige Tage Pause oder dann auch einige Wochen und dann Pause. Und ähm, es wurde auch wirklich besser. Das ist ja auch das, was uns heute noch Patienten berichten, wenn sie mal einen Monat das Gerät nehmen, sie lassen es mal eine Nacht weg, ist es nicht so schlimm wie vorher. Ja? Aber es, es war eben zum einen nicht so effektiv, dass man sagen konnte, man lässt eine Zeit lang weg. Zum anderen war es einfach auch nicht so praktikabel, weil wenn man sagt, fünf Tage nehmen sie es, zwei Tage lassen, lassen sie es weg, dann kennen wir die Problematik mit der Therapieadherenz, dass dann die Phasen, wo sie es weglassen, länger werden, die, wo sie es nehmen, kürzer werden. Von daher war, hat man sich dann doch dazu geeinigt, es als, als, als Langzeittherapie sozusagen zu empfehlen, als, als, als tägliche Therapie. Perhaps we, we ask at that stage, yes. um, of course. any questions at that stage, I mean, early days. Wir laden Sie schon mal herzlich ein, wenn Sie nachher Zeit haben, 17 Uhr 45, 45, vielen Dank, 17 Uhr 45, ähm, hält er einen Vortrag bei uns im Symposium, ähm, ich durfte einen Teil des Vortrags schon mal sehen in New Orleans dieses Jahr, ähm, das sind sensationelle Bilder einfach, das ist jetzt, die Geschichte ist schon sehr spannend, wenn man die, die, die Bilder mit dazu sieht, auch das Equipment, ja, man darf nicht vergessen, dass, 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 dass die, der erste Raum, wo die ihre Versuche gemacht haben, war der Raum, wo das, wo das, wo das Putzequipment drin war, weil sie keinen anderen Raum gekriegt haben. Ja, also es gab einfach auch ein räumliches äh, Problem sozusagen. Also das, was wir 20 Jahre, 10 Jahre später in Deutschland das Problem, dass wir mit unserem Schlaflabor sozusagen in die Bäder umziehen mussten, weil wir keine Räume dafür hatten, hatten die ähm, äh, von Anfang an. Gibt es Fragen? Ja, hier hinten. Did you ever close a friend for me to get a patient on? On a basal ventilation therapy. Did you ever close one of your prognostomies? Oh yes. On a basal ventilation therapy, when you see it work. Yes, yes, I did. Uh, in in when I first one of the first groups of patients I was looking after were those who had neuromuscular disease and hypoventilation, and uh, I uh, one I remember one of the first patients I actually treated with tracheostomy had acid maltase or pompous disease and he, we managed him with a tracheostomy and a cuirass because he uh, occluded during negative pressure ventilation. As soon as we realized that you could stabilize the upper airway we transferred him onto a non-invasive ventilation. At the time it was uh, the access to suitable ventilators was very inadequate because they were volume cycled or pressure cycled uh, but we used we adapted the CPAP machine to have what was essentially bi-level however it took respironics to develop the flow trigger to produce the bi-level before that became a, a major option. I should say that, um, uh, th that some of the patients become very attached to their machines and uh, it's possibly because I'm uh, now talking at a time I would normally be dreaming <laughs> and I'm recovering some of these memories but one of my patients who was a very large uh, ex-serviceman, Vietnam vet, had terrible sleep apnea and we put him onto the machine and uh, he did very well, <coughs> but he came back with his, to show me his machine and he'd uh, uh, covered it in pink lace and called it Lulu. <laughs> 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 so, but it certainly kept him breathing. <laughs> it's pimp my CPAP. That's right, that's right, that's right. That's we, right. Could, we could do a show that's and right. we were that's you, right. you know, it's not a problem. I that's think right. everybody that's understood right. Lulu. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Weitere Frage. Da hinten war da auch noch eine Frage, oder? War da nicht? I would like to ask a question right now. <coughs> There's a lot of talk about oropharyngeal training to make the muscles stronger, to keep them from collapsing. What do you think about that as a possible yeah. therapy? Well, I think there's quite good evidence that it does help. Uh, I don't know how 
much it helps. That's the problem. <clears throat> I think a lot, of the, a lot of the other therapies like that will have an effect but won't completely remove the snoring and obstruction. And I think one of the uh, mechanisms by which you go from snoring to obstructive apnea is the, the vibration injury of the airway itself. So I think although you can probably shift someone back from severe apnea to more mild apnea, if they've still got the snoring, that's then going to continue to damage and they will get worse. However, I know, of course, the first paper to suggest that was the didgeridoo. Uh, um, <clears throat> and we, we thought about training, uh, the idea of strengthening muscles, uh, and I think it's real, uh, but I don't think it's enough. Maybe when you're younger, maybe before you develop severe apnea, uh, uh, so maybe ResMed should be selling didgeridoos <laughs> to younger people. <laughs> That's right. No, it's not. I, I, I'm not, I should not be facetious. I think that there is a very important issue of identifying people at the early stages of the problem. And I must have seen thousands of younger people, 35, uh, they've just, their snoring has become a problem and inevitably it's because they've put on five kilos, six kilos, not very much, and because their weight gain isn't very much, they ignore it. They're, their own doctor doesn't see it as a problem. And I think at that stage, if they control their weight, don't drink so much, uh, I think you can at least push back the onset of the disease maybe by 10 years. So anything that would help minimise and stop snoring, I think is a worthwhile exercise. If you can prevent people easily from getting those five kilograms, that would be even better than CPAP, you know, but um, that would be the hardest I just try to... <laughs> well, there are, people, there are people using you know, the various drugs and all the rest, but uh, I don't think, I think the, there's no question about the length of weight, yeah. but we shouldn't lose touch with the fact that it's not just weight, yeah. that's structure and function. Yeah. So there are many people who are underweight who have sleep apnea. So. Vielleicht fassen wir es kurz zusammen. Es ging um die Frage, ähm, Training des oberen Atems sozusagen, Muskeltraining. Aber es gibt eine Studie mit Literatur, es gibt eine Studie aus ähm, Brasilien mit, ähm, mit jeden Tag 30 Minuten äh, Training, also mm. Zungen- und äh, oberer Atemwegstraining und beide haben gezeigt, dass die Schlafapnoe sich ungefähr halbiert vom AI von 20 auf 10 ungefähr. Die Frage war, was er davon hält und er sagt, das ist sicherlich eine, eine Methode, die, die sich jetzt auch in Studien gezeigt hat, aber dass sie alleine wahrscheinlich nicht ausreicht. <lacht> wahrscheinlich vielleicht an einer früheren Stelle könnte das was sein. Also die Frage ist ja auch, die ihn beschäftigt ähm, heutzutage ist, ähm, wie können wir vielleicht Schlafapnoe vermeiden? Ja, gibt es vielleicht bei dem Patienten, der 30 oder 35 oder 40 ist, der jetzt das Schnarchen entwickelt mit diesen 5 Kilo Gewichtszunahme, gibt es die Möglichkeit, wenn wir die 5 Kilo Gewichtszunahme vermeiden, dass das Schnarchen nicht entsteht, dass durch das Schnarchen nicht die Schlafapnoe entsteht? Ja, also sozusagen, schon, vielleicht müssen wir die Methoden, die zwar die Schlafapnoe etwas lindern, aber nicht in der Lage sind, sie sozusagen komplett zu behandeln, vielleicht müssen wir die früher einsetzen im Sinne einer, einer, einer Prävention. Da war noch eine Frage. So, I think going a little bit more deeply into the, uh, the causes of sleep apnea and, and snoring, um, the question is unanswered so far, because um, nevertheless there are some strong links to risk factors like weight, as you told us. Um, do you think vibration, vibration as such is the problem, or I, I just think that uh, it's some kind of unknown neuromus uh, neuromuscular disease, which uh, you know, yeah. makes the yeah. neurons to yeah. attention for the muscles and then you know it goes gradually down and the vibration is just on top of it then after yeah. a certain stage of disease. Yeah, well, I mean, we're talking about the potential, why do people get it in the first place? I certainly have had a great interest in the possibility of neuromuscular abnormality. However, I've come around to the view that it starts early in life and a key issue is structure of the airway. And I think you know, we, there, we know that in the age group of three, five, three to five, ten percent of children of both sexes snore. And I think it's that snoring which is very important in altering the structure of the upper airway. We know that. We know that if uh, the, it's the Bauhaus 
process of the upper airway, form, uh, function leads form. I mean, is that, am I right? Form. <laughs> but, but we know there's this important dynamic between, if you have any obstruction, uh, of course the response is, is such to protect the airway, but at the same time to alter the structure of the airway. So that's really well documented in a, certainly animal models, and there's some very good data from particularly from Sweden, where they've had a good dental system, they could follow the structural changes. So I think we, uh, that's probably a very important baseline that sets people up to get the problem. However, there's one really important neuromuscular mechanism which is absolutely clear, and that's alcohol. Alcohol uh, causes snoring and obstruction because it's a, a alters the tone and we show that uh, many people have shown it but you you take a normal male and they drink a little bit of alcohol and they'll uh, have a more collapsible upper airway they'll snore if they're already snoring they'll develop sleep apnea it's a little bit different in women uh, partly because and I think it's because our study of younger women women tend to get more acidosis with alcohol than men so I think that's sort of semi protective but I think the same thing works so there's probably an interaction of structure, certainly function, uh, and of course something like obesity, which on top of it is uh, a big factor. But I do think that snoring injury is important. I do think that the snoring vibration, we know it damages the nerve endings, we know it damages the vessels, uh, we know the tissue gets longer and floppier, and there's quite good data to suggest you lose reflect the port of the airway. So I, my own view is that no snoring is healthy. Uh, <clears throat> so the notion of benign snoring is a mis <coughs> misnomer. It's a, ma it's a matter of how much and for how long. Uh, so we should concentrate on the, on the children? Yeah, I think so. The the That's right. On, well, well, this respect alone, but it's, it's the children's eyes, it's the, the dentist for the children, it's, it's, well, it's, it's the pediatricians as such, yeah. and it's our basic work for the tonsil and, and the Absolute, Absolutely. Absolutely. The deformed, uh, the, the absolutely. <laughs> well, I think I, my part of my focus is I work on children. That's where I'm focused. And I, I think there's been a pendulum shift. Uh, the reason why everyone had their adenoids and tonsils out was based on really good clinical evidence. These children changed. And of course the pendulum shifted the other way that now even in my own city certain physicians think it's a cosmetic procedure. You know. But we know, so I think that treating upper airway obstruction in childhood should be done. <clears throat> the problem, the, the really remarkable problem about adenotonsillectomy and obstructed breathing in children is that there's a really important lesson in here. We've known for a hundred years or more that adenotonsillectomy has an incredible effect on a five-year-old and the parents come back and say, it's a different child, he's better. I think because many of them have <coughs> such a good response, there's an assumption that they all have that response. We now know it's not correct. So it's only in the last few years that people have actually measured before and after adenotonsillectomy. When you look at that, you find that yes, it has a great effect, but about 30% don't get much of an effect, 10% get worse. So I think we've, it's, a, it's an example where <clears throat> the obvious and the good outcome has actually blinded us to the other end of the spectrum. So that's where it's gone wrong, but I think now, I, wor I work very closely with the nose and throat <coughs> colleagues and I'm often saying, please do this procedure. However, we also get our orthodontist to look at it. You know, all of these children with cross bites, the orthodontists have been working on for years, but they haven't thought about, of course, the upper airway. And uh, that's now happening. So I think there's a really important uh, ear, nose and throats, orthodontist and, and physician working together and having a plan for that child. My suspicion is that this pendulum swinging away from adenotonsillectomy has probably given us a lot more adult sleep apnea than we would have otherwise had. It's a thought, but without, uh, without evidence. Also, ganz kurz zusammen, also es ging viel um die, die Form und Funktion des Open Atemweges. 
Und letztendlich will man den auch schon vielleicht in der Jugend ähm, so ähm, in Anführungszeichen, ich sage jetzt mal, präparieren kann, dass, er, dass man als Erwachsener vielleicht gar keine Schlafarbeit mehr kriegt. Das ist auch einer seiner Schwerpunkte, seiner Arbeit inzwischen ist, mit Kindern zu arbeiten, zum einen mit, mit, mit HNO-Ärzten, ähm, wo er auch sagt, dass früher wurde, wurden Adenoide in Tonsillen viel, viel aggressiver operiert als heutzutage und heutzutage eher von der Schlafmedizin die Forderung kommt, das wieder aggressiver zu machen, weil wir da vielleicht ähm, auch Schlafapnoe bei Erwachsenen dann vermeiden können oder schon im Kindesalter vermeiden können, aber dann auch eben im Erwachsenenalter. Und das Zweite, was sicherlich eine, was sehr wichtig ist bei Kindern, ist einfach die, die Funktion des Kiefers, der Biss sozusagen, dass sicherlich die, ähm, die, die ja, Kieferorthopäden im Moment schon drauf schauen, dass der Biss bei Kindern sehr aggressiv optimiert wird. Aber wo sie natürlich ähm, Kieferorthopäden primär nicht dran denken, ist, dass wir durch die Veränderung des Bisses auch die Funktion des oberen Atemweges verändern können. Und durch das nach, vor allem das nach vorne holen des Unterkiefers ähm, beim Erwachsenen dann die Chance ähm, schaffen, äh, obstruktive Schlafapnoe zu vermeiden, sodass gerade Kinder ähm, ein Ansatz sind, ähm, wo wir vielleicht im Sinne der Prävention von Schlafapnoe ähm, äh, viel tun können. Perhaps a final remark um, uh, from you. Um, 30 years of CPAP, 30 years, I mean, um, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's, it's well. um, different with, with, with humans because they look different after 30 years. Normally bigger, your CPAPs have grown <laughs> much smaller the last 30 years. Where do you think we'll be heading with, with therapy the next 30 years? Well, I suppose the first comment I would say is that I still am amazed that this is the therapy after 30 years. I, um, and uh, however, <coughs> having said that, I'm also familiar with just how extensive uh, the improvement uh, that occurs in patients. And I am continued to be amazed at the results that are now coming out from long-term treatment trials, like the data, f particularly from the Spanish group, who've got uh, uh, Jose Marin and co, we've got these long-term data showing a dramatic difference in cardiovascular outcomes. And I think probably that's been the turning point for this whole area, because no matter how much we tell our colleagues that snoring and sleepiness is bad for you. Certainly a lot of our colleagues, like particularly our cardiology friends, <laughs> I'm not being rude, I mean they're, they're dealing with you know, people who are dying in front of them, so it's not a, I'm not being cynical about it, but um, uh, don't think much about snoring or sleepiness, all right? That's lazy and all the rest, but so I think that, I, I know it's not, but I think that the cardiovascular outcomes I think all of us in the early days had a hint that that was the case, but uh, it's much greater than I ever dreamed of that there was that link. I think the treatment's uh, evolution is, it's still the same machine, it's still the same circuit, but the evolution of the technology is marvellous. Uh, firstly, the, the mask technology, uh, the liquid silicon injection which really has occurred in parallel. The first to make that silicon membrane, which is so strong yet so thin, is really only an innovation that's occurred in industry during the late 1980s. Uh, the other thing that's changed, of course, in these, it's got these amazing little motors, which are, again, was driven by another area, which is hard drives on disks. It's the brushless DC motor, and of course the electronics. I think it's here to stay. I think it's a little bit like glasses. People say, oh, well, surely we're going to get rid of it and have laser surgery, etc." But I think glasses are going to be around for another uh, 30 years. There's pacing, airway pacing, which I, uh, there will be a role for that. I think it'll be probably fairly narrow for at least a while. And it'll be very much more expensive than this. This is incredibly inexpensive therapy. And I, when you think about it, uh, it's very inexpensive therapy. Um, I think uh, one of the things that I do not cease to be amazed at is the extent of the sleep disordered breathing and my current area of research is looking at uh, obstructed breathing uh, in pregnancy which uh, we are now quite sure has a, a role in inducing hypertension of pregnancy so it's, again it's another area of great interest. Also, um es zusammenzufassen, letztendlich geht er davon aus, dass auch in 30 Jahren die CPAP-Therapie noch die Haupttherapie der Schlafapnoe sein wird, weil er, er vergleicht das nimmt einen guten Vergleich mit den, mit den Brillen, die ja letztendlich nun auch in vielen Fällen durch Laser 
Behandlung sozusagen äh, ersetzt werden könnten. Aber wie man sieht, ist die Brille trotzdem noch nach wie vor die Nummer 1 Therapie ähm, der Sehschwäche sozusagen. Deshalb geht er auch davon aus, dass das dass CEPAP sich weiter durchsetzt. Er sagt auch, die, die Entwicklung, die da drin steckt, sozusagen für jemand wie ihn, der die Dinger selber gebaut hat, ist es absolut fantastisch zu sehen, insbesondere die Maskentechnologie mit den dünnen Silikonen, mit dem Material heutzutage, was zur Verfügung ist und mit den, mit den kleinen Gebläsen sozusagen, wenn man früher den Hitachi anschaut und jetzt heute sozusagen die kleinen Gebläse in den Geräten. Was er sieht in der Entwicklung ist sicherlich, was im Moment spannend ist von der technischen Entwicklung ist, es gibt jetzt eine zweite Welle mit Schrittmachern, mit Schrittmacherfunktionen, Nerval, also Muskel des oberen Atemweges. Gab es ja schon mal eine vor, vor über einer Dekade, die damals recht schnell wieder eingestellt wird. Da sieht er sicherlich einen, einen, im Moment zum Beispiel einen wissenschaftlichen Raum, wobei man sagen muss, dass diese Therapie deutlich kostspieliger und schwieriger sein wird, aber da wird sicherlich Entwicklung in die Richtung gehen. Ansonsten ähm, er sagt immer Cardiology Friends, ähm, ja. ähm, wir sind ja, gehen sozusagen auf die Kardiologen seit Jahren zu, aber das ist sicherlich der andere Teil der Therapie, dass wir mehr in den Herz-Kreislauf-Bereich gehen und ähm, der zweite Teil der vorgesagten Arbeit für mit Kinder, aber ein, ein, ein seiner Hauptforschungsarbeiten im Moment, wo, wo sie auch ein, ein großes Forschungsgrant, ähm, also Forschungsunterstützung haben in Sydney, ist eine schwangere Frau. Ja? Und schwangere Frauen und ähm, er hatte vielleicht heute Morgen, wenn ich das anfüge, darauf auch gesagt, ähm, bei schwangeren Frauen sehen Sie auch, dass wir einfach den Weg, wie wir Schlaf haben, nicht diagnostizieren und behandeln, verändern müssen. Weil wenn man drei Monate wartet, ist das Problem vorbei sozusagen. Und ähm, ähm, sprich, ähm, da brauchen wir einfach neue Versorgungswege, neue Wege. Aber ein, ein, ein seiner Punkte ist, schwangere Frauen zu gucken, ähm, gerade Schwangerschaftshypertonie, dadurch auch Präeklampsie und zu schauen, was da die Rolle um, von, von obstruktiver Schlafapnoe ist. Can I, can I add something else? Uh, uh, people assume that uh, I'm an evangelist for CPAP. However, I'm constantly looking for other ways of curing this disease. And I would, uh, we, be, we, we haven't talked about it today, but there is a very important, continuing important role for surgery. Uh, uh, surgeon, important to fix the nose, and make sure you have a good upper airway. Uh, there's an important role for oral devices, they have a, they have a very important place and I, I think it's still important for our surgical colleagues to keep thinking about how to improve the upper airway. I send and work with uh, orofac oromaxillary surgeons to actually do major surgery for young patients, thin patients with clear, uh, you know, who are going to face a lifetime of sleep apnea. So. The only problem with that form of surgery, of course, is it's a big deal and it's expensive, etc. But in a young, in a 19-year-old, thin person, he's got bad apnea, I will be looking down that path. And it's making sure that airway's clear with the surgery, looking at what you can do, and then uh, that's always done in link, linked in with orthodontists. So you've got to make sure the teeth are in the right place, expand the maxilla and bring it forward. So I'm very clear that I don't, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a salesman for CPAP. I'm always looking for my patients, can I cure this problem? Uh, the problem is it's not that simple. <coughs> also als abschließendes Statement wollte ich unbedingt nur sagen, obwohl er CPAP entwickelt hat, ist er jetzt keiner, der, der nur nach CPAP schaut. Er findet es gerade auch wichtig, dass wir nach alternativen Therapien schauen. Mhm. Und er äh, ja, ermuntert sozusagen sowohl seine Kollegen, die sowohl die HNOs als auch letztendlich die mund kiefer nach weiteren Methoden zu schauen. Und ähm, äh, zum anderen sagt er auch, gibt es eine, eine wachsende Rolle für äh, unterkiefer schienen die sicherlich auch ihren Stellenwert haben, die wieder in diesen Bereich reingehen. Ähm, Zahnstruktur, Bissstruktur, Struktur des oberen Artweges, was sicherlich funktionell in der Zukunft einfach auch noch eine wichtige Rolle spielen wird, sodass wir parallel hierzu nach wie vor weiter schauen müssen, was gibt es für Alternative und für weitere Therapien. Well, Colin, I think you. You, you see everybody stayed, so thank you very much for, for, for taking, take, take, thank taking thank you. your time. Yeah, you can have a signal, but you have to be back at 5.45. Okay, thank, <laughs> thank you. So thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. Thank you. I'll see you later. Okay. One thing that we haven't covered is...